If you had known your great grandmother, some of you probably have, you would be able to stretch back to at least the middle of the 19th century and so back over a period of getting on for two centuries. It's an interesting thought therefore that you'd only have to do that about eight times, each person remembering their great granny, to go back to the year 1000. Now why would I want to do that? They, of course, if they could come and see us, would find us extraordinary and surprising. They certainly wouldn't understand somebody introducing me by looking at a strange device, <laughs> which we, of course, now call a mobile phone. Or is it a mobile phone? It's a computer, vastly more powerful than was used to send a man to the moon. Coming to man on the moon, that comes later. So, they would find us astonishing, but I'm going to show you that we would find them astonishing too. You see, today, the great majority of humanity lives in cities. Now, that's in one sense a huge advantage to us. We all benefit from the advantages of cities. One of the big disadvantages is that it cuts us off from knowledge of the universe as it really is. Of course, you can go out into that quadrangle late at night, on a moonless night, and see a number of stars. But I tell you, if you have not experienced looking up at the night sky in the middle of a desert, or on a mountain top, or anywhere else where you can be free of the light that stops our eyes from adapting to the dark, you will not have experienced the universe as it really is. It's quite remarkable. Because as you look up there, it takes quite a long time. First, the stars that you and I know from looking outside in the quadrangle could know, appear. But then, as your eyes adapt, as they do over many, many, many minutes, to the intense blackness of a moonless night, and it needs to be a moonless night, you will see that you find more and more and more and more. It seems to just go on indefinitely the longer you look. And of course, you will find too that magnificent band that goes across the sky which we call the Milky Way and which we now know is in fact the collection of stars in our own galaxy. Now, I'm suggesting to you that our ancestors, you see, living in essentially unlit homes, not mostly in cities, often right out in the deep countryside, they would have experienced that as a matter of course, almost, as I say, every month with a moonless night. So, in one sense, we've been cut off from a major experience, most of us. Now, though, I want to suggest that we can nevertheless go further than they did. They must have been pretty amazed by all of that, asking themselves all kinds of why questions, why that, why me, and so on. All the deep questions that enable us to attack some of the deeper metaphysical questions that none of us can help asking. But we can go a bit further than they did, and that's because up there there is the Hubble Space Telescope. It goes around like that, as any satellite will, and around ten years ago the NASA scientists did an extraordinary experiment with it. They fixed the telescope during the period it was in the right part of the sky on just four stars just above the area of the sky that we call the plough. They chose that because it's one of the darkest parts of the sky as we look up at it. You just see four stars with the naked eye. 
even with a telescope you don't see much more. So what they were doing was to focus Hubble telescope through a kind of gap in our galaxy to look beyond the galaxy into deep space. That's exactly what they're doing. And they did that for five days. And instead of that blackness with just four stars in that one twenty-four millionth of the area of the sky, what you see fills as yet another radiant firmament, quite as wonderful as what we would experience in the depths of a desert or on, a, on the top of a mountain. But that's not all. You can go on doing that for another five days, collect the light just preferentially while the telescope is fixed on those four fixed stars and you find that even more appear. It's thousands, tens of thousands upon... Well, what are they? Because remember we're looking right outside our galaxy through into deep space. These are not stars. We're beyond the stars of our galaxy. These themselves are galaxies with trillions of stars in each. You can begin to see where this is going. You can begin to do a calculation. We know, roughly speaking, how many atoms, or rather protons mostly, because they're mostly hydrogen nuclei, form a star and the little collection of planets that might, allow, uh, might go around it. We can know also, roughly speaking, how many trillions of stars there are in a galaxy. We now know how many galaxies there are in that one twenty-fourth millionth of the sky reaching back through around 13 billion years ago. You can add all of that up and you can multiply by 24 million you see to then get an idea of what's the size of the universe? How many, well mostly protons but other particles too, how many particles are in the known universe? Well you can do the calculation, it's 10 and then 80 zeros after the 10. The mathematicians amongst you will know that you don't write it like that, you write 10 to the power 80. So remember that figure, 10 to the power 80. It's astronomic. It's almost super astronomic. It's an unimaginable number. It takes a whole paragraph to write it down in standard decimal form. That increases our wonder at the extraordinary nature of the universe. And it also has led us to ask some very interesting metaphysical questions about the universe. But you know, the most surprising thing about the universe is not all of that. The most surprising and wonderful thing is you, or you, or you, or me, possibly. Because what I'm going to do now is to go in the opposite direction. Rather than use a telescope going up there beyond our universe, beyond our galaxy, I mean, to the edge of the universe, I'm going to go in exactly the other direction using microscopes to delve down into you and me, our bodies. Biologists have done that for 150 years, roughly, steadily drilling down to the individual molecules that form the proteins that make our muscles move, to the genes that enable those to be coded for and produced, um, and so we have broken the system down into its most fundamental components. Incidentally, just to get an idea of scale for a moment, we've gone from us here in this room, as it were, up to beyond our galaxy. If you took a proton in our bodies, that's a hydrogen ion, so it actually exists in our bodies as pH, so as acidity, and, and you expanded it up to about this sort of size, the cell from which we took it would be way beyond the edge of the solar system as an edge. And the body itself, your or my body, would be a bit like uh, a galaxy. Um, I mention that because that means there are many scales down there as there are up here. So you won't be surprised by the next calculation I'm going to do. What is thought to characterize us as humans? Well, some biologists say 
it's our genome. Well, in one sense that is sort of true, and certainly if you get held up in court and somebody wants to find out whether you really did do this crime or not, they will take your DNA. But I tell you, that's a bit like taking your fingerprint. It is a molecular fingerprint. It is not the cause of you. That may surprise some of you, particularly amongst the biologists, but I'm very happy when we come to questions um, to deal with that. But to continue with what I want to say about this, how many genes are there? We now know, we sequence the human genome, it's about 25,000. There's no more than there are in a mouse. The number of genes certainly doesn't define the difference between you and a mouse. Some plants have more genes than we have. So clearly it can't be numbers of genes. What, if it's not numbers of genes, what is it? It must be, it can't be the numbers, the individuals, it must be the interactions. Now we come to another very interesting calculation, you see. How many interactions could there be between 25,000 components. Remember that's only the genes, there are many other things in your bodies as well as the genes, so I'm taking as it were a, a sort of rather, sh how should I put this, a minimalist view of the total number of possible components there are, but let's do that because it still produces a surprising result. 25,000. How many interactions could there be? And how would it compare to that number 10 to the 80 that we got from looking at the size of the universe? Well, you'll already guess that the answer must be that it's greater, otherwise I wouldn't be giving you this talk. It is unimaginably greater. You've got to add three more zeros to that 80. It's actually 10, roughly speaking, to the 70,000. There wouldn't have been enough time during the whole four and a half billion years of evolution for nature to have experimented in the sense of natural selection and so on with more than a tiny fraction of those possible interactions. And indeed only a very tiny fraction of them will actually occur in your body and mine. So the most astonishing thing about the universe in terms certainly of scale, in terms of complexity, is not so much what Hubble found in getting a feel right out to the edge of the known universe, but here in this room studying you or me. And it's still the major challenge for scientists to work out what is happening. I will just finish my remarks with one or two caveats to, to put on this. Some people might say, well, does that mean that we're all unique? Well, of course it does. <laughs> there will never, ever, ever be another you. <laughs> We'd have to wait billions and billions of years more for evolution ever to c come round with a situation where it produces an exact copy of anybody else. And you might say, well, is that really true? scientists can out make clones and there are sort of natural clones they're called twins well I have to tell you something else those twins are not the same nor are any clones because on top of that information that we call genetics there's a whole other layer of what we call epigenetics, the control of the genetics, the genome, by the rest of the system, and that is even more complicated, and we're only beginning to understand the full immensity of the epigenetics that lies beyond. And if you wish to do a comparison again with what I was saying earlier on about the universe, if studying the genetics was getting to understand our galaxy, <laughs> as it were, our local galaxy, then the epigenetics is all of those galaxies uh, beyond. And that's the reason why each of us is both unique, special, and quite difficult to understand. And so the most remarkable thing about the universe is not the universe itself, it's you. Thank you very much.